Thank you, Jim, for that lovely song. A perfect introduction to the message today. We have been going through the kings of Judah. It's been a long journey. We've come to the last four kings, and they're all grouped together, and you'll see why as we get into the message. But uh, just to do a quick review on the kings of Judah, that's the list there. Um, I've put some. Right, I'll put that one. Ah, do we get? Got to get used to how to do this. Right, these numbers down the side here. That's approximately the date they came to rule to, to rule over Judah. The numbers at the other end, in brackets, that's how long they ruled over Judah. And. Uh, the whole point of this exercise is not to do a history lesson because that covers about 520 years of history. And Australia is only at 234 years, I calculated this morning. Um, so the uh, whole point is we've been looking at were they a good or a bad, evil king? I was almost said bad because there's a difference between a bad king and an evil king which I'll probably get to explain a bit later as well. But the whole thing is that we're looking at whether they were good or evil. And the um, next slide, there were five good kings. There were 23 kings altogether, including Saul and David and Solomon, who ruled over the combined kingdom. There's only five who were classified as good kings. When we classify them as good kings, they started well and they finished well. They kept going. They were good kings. And uh, there were six who started well but finished badly. They just uh, just lost, it, lost their track. And we've come across those as we've gone through these uh, kings and we said how important it is to finish well. There were only two who started as evil and they finished good. Well, probably not good, but certainly a lot better. And uh, so they were few and far between. And the group we're looking at today is the ones that are not highlighted. There were 10 kings who were classed as evil. They started evil, they finished evil. They just were failures in God's sight. Now, I say they were evil because it doesn't necessarily mean they were a bad king, but they were evil in God's sight, and that's what we're looking at today. And uh, now we're going to read from uh, Chronicles chapter 36, the last chapter of Chronicles. Now, we've had te teachers come up here before and said, we've looked at the uh, what we're doing, and we can read four or five chapters and still not cover the whole lot. One chapter, 14 verses, is all I'll be reading directly from here. Second Chronicles chapter 36, and commence reading at verse 1. Now this is after Josiah. We've got uh, Josiah, he was the, the last good king. This is after he, he has died, and we'll get to, come on, have a look at him a bit further later. Being fathers, though, we need to look at the dad. 2 Chronicles 36, 1. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and made him king in Jerusalem in place of his father. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. The king of Egypt dethroned him in Jerusalem and imposed on Judah a levy of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. The king of Egypt made Eliakim a brother of Jehoahaz, king over Judah, and Jerusalem, and charged Eliakim's, changed Eliakim's name to Jehoiakim. But Necho took Eliakim's brother Jehoahaz and carried him off to Egypt. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. 
Nebuchadnezzar also took to Babylon articles from the temple of the Lord and put them in his temple. The other events of Jehoiakim's reign, the detestable things he did, and all that was found against him are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for three months and ten days. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In the spring, Jeho King Nebuchadnezzar sent for him and brought him to Babylon, together with the articles of value from the temple of the Lord. And he made Jehoiachin's uncle, Zedekiah, king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of, of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Just 14 verses, and they give us the basic history of these four kings. There's almost a repeat for it in 2 Kings 24. We can look at other chapters, like chapter 22 of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah is prophesying against these kings. Um, but basically, 14 verses. We don't get much to go on, but there is much to learn. Did you notice that refrain as we read through there? They did evil in God's sight. Three of those four kings, he said, they did evil in God's sight. They, uh, but it just went on. They, they, oh, I think I've gone on too far. Right back there, I just want to have a. That's that one I wanted. I want you to notice here that um, Jehoaz was the son of Josiah. Now that's logical. Josiah was the previous king. But do you notice that, whoops. Uh, I've lost it. Okay. That's all right. Um, notice that uh, Joe has ruled for three months. Jehoiakim was, was then put in as king. Now, he was the brother of Jehoaz, and he ruled for 11 years. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to keep up swapping and going and coming back because I want to deal with one point and then deal with another point in the, each of these lives as we go through. Jehoiachin, he was the son of Jehoiakim. So he's the grandson of Josiah. He ruled for three months and 10 days. And Zedekiah, he was Jehoiachin's uncle, but in the fact, he was Josiah's son. So three kings, Jehoiaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah, all sons of Josiah, all three failed in God's sight. So I want to look at um, Josiah. He, he's the, uh, the central figure in all this at this point. He was the last good king of Judah. And I wondered why three of his sons, not one of them, followed the Lord anywhere in their life. Not one of them. And his grandson didn't. They had all failed. But Josiah began to reign when he was eight years old. And we read, uh, and uh, we read that he began, and Neil brought this out last week very well. In his eighth year as king, he cleansed the temple. 
in his 18th year as king, he repaired the temple. Remember when they repaired the temple, they found the lost book and he read it and he turned back to God. And again, in the 18th year of his reign, he celebrated the Passover. He was king for 31 years. He was killed by Pharaoh Nico when he was 39 years old after ruling for 31 years. But all his sons, they did evil in God's sight. So why didn't his sons follow his lead? Why didn't they learn from him? Why didn't they do what they should have been doing? There's an important lesson we can learn here, especially seeing it's Father's Day. And I'll make this comment. Being a godly father is no guarantee that our children will follow in our footsteps. We wish it was, but there's no guarantee. So what can we learn from Josiah and his family? Let's have a look at his family. When Josiah was killed in that battle with the uh, king, of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, it says there that the people appointed Jehoahaz, his son, as king. But he rebelled against uh, Pharaoh. And after three months, Pharaoh came back up and captured him. So, one king down. Jehoiakim, his brother, became king. Now, in the meanwhile, in the next couple of years, Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene and he goes down and attacks Pharaoh and he captures him. So now Nebuchadnezzar is the ruling or the chief ruling monarch in the Tair region. And you read in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign that Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jerusalem and he captures them. But Jehoiakim wasn't taken away. He was left in the country to rule. He was a, a vassal, I say, of the king of Nebuchadnezzar. And it was that time when Daniel was taken away in captivity, we read in Daniel chapter 1 and 1, verse 1, that Daniel was taken away in that captivity in the third year of Jehoiakim. Eight years later, Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar came back again and took him into captivity. So he ruled for 11 years. And in his place, Jehoiachin, his son, was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar and he ruled for three months and 10 days. And he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar recalled him to Babylon. There's two versions of this. One was he was recalled, another one that Nebuchadnezzar came down to attack him and he just surrendered and went back with Nebuchadnezzar. Anyway, he went back. He was taken captive. And this time we read in 2 Kings 24, 14, that there were at least 10,000, and I think men, in that captivity. There was the numbers, the soldiers, the um, uh, tradesmen and so on. And they were taken back to uh, Babylon. Mordecai and Esther were among that group. We read that in Esther chapter 2, verse 6. Now Zedekiah was, was appointed the new king. He was the uncle to Jehoiachin, but actually the brother to Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. I keep getting these mixed up, so be um, But he rebelled, and Nebuchadnezzar had to attack him, and he took him into captivity along with the rest of the royal family and the officials. That was the end of the line of kings in Judah. That was the end. They were, they were taken into captivity. Zedekiah was the last king. So Je King Josiah, the father, he was a common link with these four, four kings. He was father and grandfather to them. And I believe the highlight of Josiah's reign 
was when he instituted the celebration of the Passover in his 18th year. And Neil gave us a good outline of that last week. So taking this as a reference point, we can see that Jehoahaz, he would have been 10 years old. Jehoiakim, he would have been 12 years old. Both of them were old enough to remember that special occasion. And if they remember that special occasion, why didn't they follow in their, his father's footsteps? Jehoiachin, the grandson, he wasn't put yet born. Another three years, I think, before he was born. But Zedekiah, he would have been three years old, the youngest brother. At three years old, would he have remembered the Passover? I think he would. It was such a feast, such a celebration. I think at three years old, he would have remembered. My earliest memory is when I was three years old and my grandfather died. He collapsed, milking cows. I was three. And that is still with me. I think Zedekiah would have remembered that's, a, that's Passover celebration, but it didn't make any difference. He was still an evil king. Three sons and a grandsons. They all failed to learn the lessons of history. So maybe there's a father here today who's a God-fearing and a God-worshipping and honouring father whose child is not walking with the Lord. I'd like to briefly explore a few ideas as to why this may happen, even though we're not told in Scripture. So I'm just treading carefully here because I don't want to be accused of adding to the Scriptures. But I believe these are good, valid reasons. First one we read is that Josiah was a good king, but then... We read that he led the, brought the people back to God. He repaired the temple. He instituted the Passover. And I think at that crucial age when these two sons were 10 and 12 and the other one three, um, that he was probably so caught up in what he is doing that he didn't have time for his sons. Just, just putting my words there. We can be so caught up with what we're doing in our secular work, we can be so caught up with doing things for our work. We can take home work home with us and work hours at night when we should be spending time with our children. It's a warning for us not to be caught up with our work. We can be caught up with our Christian work, with our visitation, with our study, whatever it is. We can be caught up there so that we're not giving time to our children. We need to give our children that valuable time to work with them to sit with them and enjoy them we need to get that balance right here's another reason they could have they could have got caught up with their wrong friends when they became kings they could have been caught up with their wrong with the wrong friends peer pressure is a major uh, uh, problem with young people or probably with all people we need to make sure that they have good Christian friends. We need to make sure that they are guided in the right direction. Now, a lot of the time they don't like that. They don't like people, parents interfering. They don't like parents trying to help them that way. In fact, a lot of children resent it. But as a parent, we are responsible to, to give them that training. We need to encourage our children to attend church, to attend church youth groups, to attend Sunday school, to attend a Bible study. We need to encourage them, not with a whip, but we need to encourage them so that they get have good Christian friends. If there's no, no youth group, start one. Nothing wrong with that. Get together with a couple of families and start a youth group so that they have good friends working together. There are some activities that we can get our children involved in that will encourage them. I heard this just this week 
that there's a team mission being put together to go to Thailand at Christmas. Six weeks working with orphans in Thailand. What an opportunity. We can encourage our children, our grandchildren to get involved. We've just been advertising and uh, uh, announcements about a, a camp at Pialba, the y young adults camp at Pialba. Encourage your children to go. Encourage your grandchildren to go. When I was preparing for today, I was talking to somebody and they said, have you got something for the grandparents? Here's something for the grandparents. You can encourage your grandchildren to go to these camps. You can encourage your children to go on these missions. And if one way you encourage them, pay for them. Help them. They don't have the funds. You're retired. You've got the money. Help them. We can help our young people. We need to be helping them. So, uh, and if we do that, if we pay for them to go, that's probably the best investment we could ever put into our life or into their life. The next point, we need to pray for them. As parents and as grandparents, we need to pray for them. Really diligently pray for them. I came across this quote from Max Licardo. And I like to read it because it says it all. He says this, never underestimate the prayers of a Christian parent. Never underestimate the power that comes when a parent pleads with God on behalf of a child. Who knows how many prayers are being answered right now because of the faithful prayers of a parent 10 or 20 years ago. God listens to thoughtful parents. And he continues, praying for our children is a noble task. If what we are doing in this fast-paced society is taking us away from prayer time for our children, we are doing too much. We can become so involved that we can lose time to pray. And he continues on, there is nothing more special, more precious than time a parent spends struggling and praying with God on behalf of a child. As a father, we have an awful responsibility. We are responsible for our children. We are responsible to our children. Let us be sure that we are living up to that responsibility. The Bible simply says that these three kings, or these four kings, did evil in God's sight. They did evil in God's sight. Go back to the days of the judges before Israel had a king. We flip through the pages there and almost on every page we can read these words and Israel again sinned, did evil in God's sight. Israel did evil. When we get to the kings, it is the king did evil. The king is the one who's responsible. He's the leader. He's responsible for what the people do. So what is judged as being evil in God's sight? Especially for a leader especially for a father. Let us just go back to when Joshua led the children of Israel into Canaan. They had been on the campaign to capture Canaan for over seven years and were now in the mop-up stage of the war. Joshua was old, he was about to die, and he delivered some serious warnings to the children of Israel before he died. And he said in Joshua 23, verses 6 to 8, Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Without turning aside to the right or to the left, do not associate with these nations which remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their God or swear by them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. And again, Joshua chapter 23, verses 12 and 13, he says, But if you turn away and lie yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you. 
and rips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. If you turn away, you will perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And again in Joshua 24, 20, we read, if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. He will make an end of you. We've heard so often that when God says something and makes a promise, that what he says he will do, he will do. The children of Israel had turned away from God. I had forsaken the Lord. But they had plenty of warnings. In about 721 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was defeated and captured by Sennacherib, king of Syria. Sennacherib also attacked King Hezekiah. But God defended Judah at that time. This should have been a warning to the people and to the king of, Israel, of Judah. The first king we're looking at today, Jehoahaz, was captured by Pharaoh Nego. This should have been an added warning that they were in danger. They're treading on so uh, bad soil. The southern kingdom of Judah was in danger. And the next two kings were captured by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Assyria. And as each king was captured, it should have been a warning. But no. They continued to worship false gods. Nebuchadnezzar attacked Judah in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign and again in the 11th year. The whole climax to this series came about when Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar and he was captured by Nebuchadnezzar. When he was captured, this time, Nebuchadnezzar killed his sons in front of him. Then he plucked out his eyes, so the last thing he saw was the death of his children. All because he had disobeyed God. He had forsaken his God. Now, the devil was having a feast at this time because he thought he'd killed all the hares. All of Hezekiah's sons were killed. He thought he was going to stop the coming of the Messiah. But God wasn't working through Hezekiah. He was working through Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin. And they were in captivity in uh, Babylon. And in 2 Kings 25, 27 to 30, we read that uh, Jehoiachin had a special place in the heart of the king of Babylon. We read there that he was re still referred to as the king of Judah. Even in captivity, he was referred to as the king of Judah. We read there that he dined at the king's table. That the king made a special provision for him, so he never had was in need of anything. And we also read he had a family. because. In Jeremiah 24, 1 and Jeremiah 27, 1, he is referred to as Jeconiah. And Jeconiah is listed in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. He had special privileges. He was in prison, but he was a, a privileged position. Back to Zedekiah. God had taken him, taken the people into captivity because they disobeyed God and worshipped other gods. Some, we read, even offered their own children as sacrifices. They would remain in captivity for 70 years, eventually being returned, but they never had another king. Some might say that Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim were badly done by they were kings for three months or three months and 10 days. They were young men. They were only 23 and 18 years respectively when they went, took over the throne. So can we judge them and say, 
they were evil at that age with that limited response uh, experience can god judge them as being evil this is a huge responsibility for a young man Jehoaz and Jehoiachin both failed the people and they failed God. Lachlan Margaret's teaching us a few weeks ago on King Hezekiah showed that Hezekiah opened the doors of the temple and repaired them. He also had the priests consecrate themselves and then consecrate the temple. And he had them remove all the defilement from the temple. All this in the first month and he restored the celebration of the passover in his second month as king joash the child king who's only eight years old under his uncle jehoiada the priest destroyed his evil grandmother who murdered his brothers he destroyed the prophets of baal and destroyed their altars and he was only eight years old later he rebuilt the temple so yes, I can expect a, a king at 23 and 18 with limited experience, he could rule the country, make those decisions. Jehoiachin was king, uh, it ruled for three months and 10 days. Do your maths. That's a hundred days. Does that sound familiar to you? A hundred days? We hear a lot about the first hundred days of a new president for a prime minister. Last Monday, our PM addressed the National Press Club in Canberra. The occasion, 100 days as prime minister. It almost went unnoticed. So what is so special about 100 days? What makes, what, what has made it special? President Roosevelt, Back in 1933, he did, made a radio address for coming out into the uh, out of the recession, and he says this: "We all wanted the opportunity of a little quiet thought to examine and assimilate in a mental picture the crowding events of the hundred days which had been devoted to the starting of the wheels of the New Deal." And the report goes on, since then, the first hundred days of a presidential term was taken on symbolic significance. And the period is considered a benchmark to measure the early success of a president or prime minister. So for our young kings, they had 100, 90 days or 100 days to prove themselves, but they did not. They still rejected God. They rejected the Lord. And God judged them accordingly. And God judges according to his promises. There's one promise God made to David. It's in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So we could probably ask the question. God has judged them. He's taken them into captivity. There's no king. Has God failed them? I remind you that God is the same yesterday, today, forever. Go back to Genesis chapter one, uh, chapter one, Adam and Eve. God said to them, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat of that tree, you will die. They ate. They didn't die immediately. They were died in that they were separated from God. In Genesis 3.23, we read this. The Lord God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. The Lord banished Adam and Eve back then. He's banished Israel from their promised land back in the time of these kings. He's the same yesterday today forever so they were taken into captivity but they weren't going to stay there we're told 
in Jeremiah that after 70 years they would be returned. They would come back to their land, but they never had a king. And the uh, children of Israel were for all, always looking for their king. Matthew 21, 20, uh, verse 5 we read, See, your king comes to you riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And again in Matthew 27, 37, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. Jesus came to them. They didn't recognize him. And instead, they put him to death. They crucified him. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. Most important, he's coming back to take us home to be with him. How important it is for us that we have our children accompany us as we go home with him. Fathers, this is a great responsibility. We want to take our children with us. God doesn't have grandchildren. He has, has children. I'd like to close with this quote from Stuart Briscoe. It says it all. It has been said that the Christian faith is never more than one generation away from extinction. This may be an alarmist statement, but there is an element of truth in it. There are cultures in the Western world at the present time that have seen a progressive decline in spiritual nurture over three generations to such an extent that these cultures, which were previously strongholds of the faith, are now post-Christian societies. Mission fields as dark as any primitive society. He goes on, the answer to such a threat is simply, well, this is the part that I want to bring out. Every man who brings a child into the world should accept the privilege and the responsibility of seeing that his child is given a working knowledge of the Lord, of his dealings with mankind, his offer of salvation and the joys of living in vital communion with him. No one can guarantee the next generation will come in faith, but everyone can make sure they have that chance. Amen. Fathers, we have a great responsibility. We have to step up to that responsibility. And remember, don't be too busy for your children. Give them good Christian friends and most of all, pray for them. And grandfathers, pray for them. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons we're able to learn from your word. Lord, help us to take them to heart, that we will be good fathers and good grandfathers, that we'll do everything we can to have our children follow us. And Lord, we just pray for our children, that you will speak to them each one that you'll encourage them that they too will want to know you as Lord and Savior. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.